The following program is sponsored by CBN. Coming up, the pastor who married Kim Yi and parties with Bieber. Rich Wilkerson Jr. explains why he's a friend of sinners. And then, an abortion doctor. I didn't consider the fetus in the equation at all. Who was forced to make the choice to kill. And they said I needed to do the procedure. Her radical change of heart. I probably murdered more people than Ted Bundy or any of the mass murderers. On today's 700 Club. Well, welcome, folks, to this edition of the 700 Club. It looks like another nor'easter is hitting the East Coast. Washington, D.C., shutting down. They say, well, we're going to shut down the government because we don't have the right votes and stuff. But the Lord says, I'm going to send some snow up there, and you can't move. <laughs> so that's the word. And, you know. and we're supposed to get snow here tonight, but I don't know how because they, they're only calling for lows around yeah. 37. Well, they, You've got to have 32 degrees for snow, it'll, right? It'll, uh, it'll melt as soon as it hits the ground. But anyhow, we've got a lot of rain going on, but this snow is really... Uh, can you imagine, uh, yesterday was, a, no, today's the first day of spring. Well, yesterday 25th. actually was technically, uh, the 20th was the first day. Today's the 21st. the 21st. It used to be the 21st. Yeah, I, th yeah. I think somebody changed the dates mm -hmm. on us, but I still say the f 21st is the first day of spring. That's today, and so we're going to freeze <laughs> because of global warming. <laughs> Keep that in mind. Well, anyhow, he was the suspect in that string of, of uh, uh, bombings in Houston, Texas. Austin. Oh, excuse me, Austin, Texas, and early today, as authorities closed in on, uh, well, rather than be captured, this guy blew himself up. Yeah, now investigators are looking into what his motives were for planting bombs that killed two people and injured five others. Heather Sells has the story. Austin police say that the bombing suspect is dead after an officer involved shooting north of Austin. The suspect killed himself with one of his bombs just before authorities closed in. As members of the Austin Police Department SWAT team approached the vehicle, the suspect detonated a bomb inside the vehicle. Authorities were still withholding the suspect's name as the day began, but did identify him as a 24-year-old white male. His motive, they said in an early morning press conference, was unknown. So how did they find him? The Austin American Statesman says investigators used a security video from a FedEx store in Austin where they believe the suspect shipped an explosive device. Store receipts also helped, as did cell phone technology, which traced him to a local hotel. The city of Austin has been on edge for weeks since the first blast on March 2nd. People are scared. You will be too. You know, random packages showing up, explosives going off, people dying for no reason. Four bombs have exploded in Austin, killing two men and injuring five other people. The two men were killed by packages left on doorsteps. Then last weekend, two other men were injured by a device set off by a tripwire. The randomness of the attacks creating confusion and fear. When we went for a walk yesterday, instead of me pushing her forward, I kind of pulled her behind me because if I'm going to set it off, I'd rather it hit me than hit my baby. Just yesterday, another bomb exploded, this one inside a package on a conveyor belt at a FedEx shipping center southwest of Austin. Thankfully, only one minor injury. The concern now that there may be other bombs out there. Austin police have received more than 1,200 calls about suspicious packages. Heather Sells, CBN News. Well, in other news, it's being called the Four-Easter. This is the fourth Nor'easter to hit the East Coast in less than three weeks. Mark Martin has that. That's right, Pat. This latest Nor'easter is bringing strong winds, and it's expected to drop more than a foot of snow in some areas. Airlines canceled more than 3,000 flights, and schools canceled classes in many places, and the federal government shut down in Washington. Most of the storm is expected to hit New Jersey, Maryland, Delaware, and parts of eastern Pennsylvania. The latest storm comes after the region has already seen a tough winter. Between 16 strands of the flu and four nor'easters, this has been the longest winter of anybody's life. 
The storm is also expected to lead to widespread power outages. A school resource officer is being credited with potentially saving lives after he confronted a teenage shooter at a high school in Maryland Tuesday. The 17 year old shooter is dead, but he wounded two other teens during his attack. National security correspondent Eric Rosales brings us that story. The chaos began shortly before 8 o'clock Tuesday morning. Police say that a male student armed with a gun walked on to the Great Mills High School campus into a crowded hallway, opened fire. He ended up hitting a female student and a male student. It was then a resource officer came to their aid, opened fire, and ended it. You have to wonder what on earth is going on in these people's heads that they think that if I'm upset, it's okay to go kill people. This mother says she couldn't believe the text from her son stating what was happening. The things that are happening now are tragic, um, but they're, it's all because of sin. You know, God certainly is not doing this to us. It is completely um, the sinful man. She and others are thankful for school resource officer Deputy Blaine Gaskell, who quickly ran inside the building and exchanged gunfire with the shooter. Going out into an area where there was a shooting and risking your life to save someone else's, that, that's hero to me. When they put us on lockdown, we all basically had to be quiet so nothing else would happen. That's when the police started going to every classroom and make sure nobody else had a weapon. Police say the shooter, identified as Austin Wyatt Rollins, may have had a prior relationship with one of the victims, 16-year-old Jalen Willie. She remains hospitalized with life-threatening injuries. The other student, a 14-year-old boy, is in stable condition. This is something that we train, practice, and in a reality we hope would never come to fruition. It is our worst nightmare. If you don't think this can't happen at your school, you are sadly mistaken. This incident comes ahead of a national march, which will be held this Saturday as the result of the Parkland shooting in Florida last month. Eric Rosales, CBN News, Maryland. It's horrible. It just seems like one shooting after another, Pat. Well, you know, the people are really concerned about school safety. I mean, we have many, we have children or grandchildren, or almost every family. And to think that when these children would go off to school where you think they're going to be safe, that some screwball is going to be opening fire. In this case, apparently, uh, this guy had a falling out with his girlfriend, so he wants to come shoot her. I mean, where is that coming from? What's going on? Uh, we've got to get to the bottom of this, and I, I don't think that all these gun laws is going to do the job. I think we, the, it's, it's mental health in most of it, and I think we need to determine what's causing these problems. But we all want safety in schools. And amazing, now remember, they've been talking about in Florida uh, where there was bad shootings, Texas bad shootings, and so forth. Uh, if there had been an armed person on the scene, it would at least have shut down the number of casualties. That's what happened in Maryland. That guy comes in there with a gun, and he's an uh, officer or whatever, is, uh, he's uh, in, the, in the security forces in some fashion, and he takes the gunman out. We've got to do that. I, I know that's hard, but we, we've got to, you know, well, the president's talking about arming teachers. Well, maybe not teachers, but to have a military presence. We have it here at CBN. We have police officers. Our team are qualified police officers, and I think that's a very important thing, uh, especially in, in this day of chaos. It, I, went, I can't understand. I mean, this guy gets jilted by his girlfriend, so he wants to shoot her. I mean, that's not a you good know, thing. And we don't know that he wasn't thinking, I'm going to be like the Florida shooter and take out a whole class. That's right. But thank goodness that officer did his job, went in, and like you said, unfortunately had to take that student down, but he might have saved countless students' exactly. lives. Exactly. Well, by having somebody like that, so it's not guns, it is gun safety we're looking at. Yeah. Okay, Mark, what's next? President Donald Trump, Pat, says he will soon meet with Russian President Vladimir Putin. The president called Putin to congratulate him on his reelection. He said they will meet in the future to discuss what he called the arms race, along with Ukraine, Syria, and North Korea. They did not discuss Russia's meddling in the 2016 election, nor the country's suspected involvement in poisoning a former spy in Britain. And the White House is getting ready to crack down on what it calls improper Chinese trade practices. The Wall Street Journal reports the administration will release a package of measures against China tomorrow, including tariffs on imports. 
Pro-life pregnancy centers work to help women keep their babies and not abort them. But can a state force these centers to actually advertise low-cost or free abortions offered by that state? California is doing just that. But the pregnancy centers objected, and the legal battle went all the way to the Supreme Court, which heard the case on Tuesday. Paul Strand brings us that story from Washington. California pro-choice legislators passed a law demanding those centers post those advertisements at the center and online. The lawyer arguing for the pregnancy centers said that's clearly unconstitutional because it violates freedom of speech. And he says if California wins, it'll mean... A state government who has a political opposition to a particular group can force you to say things the state wants you to say but you don't want to say. It's one thing for government to ban speech. That's not acceptable. But it's even worse for the government to put words in your mouth and turn you into their marionette that they can force you to say what they want you to say. On the other we side, California's attorney general right. argues pro-life pregnancy centers aren't telling women all the facts they need to know when they're pregnant. We're concerned about making sure that people have accurate information that really gives them a chance to make an informed decision about something as precious as her health. The creator of California's law even accused pregnancy centers of lying to pregnant women and being what he calls fake health centers. And there are thousands of fake health clinics around our country, 370 in the state of California, that are unfortunately deceiving women to this effect. Representatives of the National Institute of Family and Life Advocates say those pro-life pregnancy centers are not fake health clinics and they strongly object to what California is doing. No one should be forced to provide free advertising for the abortion industry, especially not pregnancy centers. And the group's president says the implications of the case go far beyond pregnancy centers and abortion. If this law is allowed to happen, the very heart and soul of the First Amendment will be gone. Nobody should be compelled to speak a message with which they fundamentally disagree and which their conscience violates. But religious rights lawyer Matt Staver thinks it's a good bet that all the conservative justices and at least one liberal and one moderate would rule against California. It seemed to be pretty clear that the majority of justices, including Sotomayor and certainly Kennedy, were not in favor of holding this statute because of its breadth. Everybody should be concerned about this law. We're standing here, we're saying to the Supreme Court, give free speech life. This is a free speech case. We're optimistic about the results. This case isn't just about pro-life pregnancy centers, but if they lose it, then maybe any American anywhere can be forced by the government to state something that fundamentally violates their conscience. Paul Strand, CBN News, the Supreme Court. And that's a disturbing thought. What's your take on this case, Pat? Well, I, I think that what's been said is that the uh, justices will rule against California on this one. They're very uh, uh, sensitive to free speech. And I think compelling speech is something they don't want. The thing that I think has been pointed out in some of the arguments is that this law actually was narrowly focused just on these pro-life centers. They were not focused on all the pregnancy centers, on all the health uh, throughout California. Uh, the other regular hospitals aren't required to make these uh, announcements, but just the ones who were pro-life. And for that man to call them fake centers, that's ridiculous. But what is this culture of death? Why do people want to kill babies? You know, why, why do they want to do that? And uh, I think it's the thing that uh, this culture of death, I, I don't understand why that's considered liberal, why that's considered something that anybody wants to embrace. But <clears throat> you've got it, and in California, it's outrageous. So I, I think without question, given the predilections of the current court, uh, that Alito and <clears throat> Thomas and others, and the new judge, will probably vote to uh, overturn this uh, this law. Wendy? Yeah, we hope so, Pat. Yeah. Well, coming up, confessions of a former abortion doctor. I probably murdered more people than Ted Bundy or any of the mass murderers, if you consider all the abortions that I did. So what convinced this former Planned Parenthood director to stop performing abortions? You'll find out right after this. You know, there was a time that uh, it was said by those who opposed abortion that abortion was murder. 
That's what it was said, that you kill a young boy, unborn child, and it's a murder. And then, oh, you, 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 that was shouted down. You couldn't possibly say anything as outrageous as that. Well, this lady was strongly pro-choice. She personally performed hundreds of abortions. And that all changed for Dr. Kathy Altman. After a spiritual revelation, Charlene Aaron shut down with this former abortionist and brings us her amazing story of transformation. Look at this. Kathy Altman wanted to be a doctor so she could help women. After receiving her license, she took a job at a Florida women's clinic to perform abortions. There was no question in my mind that a woman should have the right to choose whether she wanted to be pregnant or not. And that, um, that was the most important thing. I didn't, uh, I didn't consider the fetus in the equation at all. Altman went on to become director of a local Planned Parenthood, where she says examining the parts of aborted babies fascinated her. I was looking at it completely from a scientific standpoint, totally devo devoid of any emotion. And it was amazing. And I used to send it, the different parts down to pathology, pathology, and then on our pathology rotation, we would look at those slides, and it, it fascinated me. She but even I performed abortions right. while pregnant. I didn't see any problem with that. My baby was wanted, their baby wasn't. It didn't seem to bother the women that I was aborting. Um, but yeah, I saw no contradiction in that, no problem with it. Dr. Altman said the only time she had qualms about what she was doing was when she worked in the intensive care unit for newborns. That's where Altman found herself trying to save babies who were the same age as those she killed. Thoughts she quickly dismissed. If she wanted the baby, then I did everything I could to give her a happy, healthy baby. If she miscarried, I would be distraught with her and upset about losing that baby. After having her first child, the doctor came face to face with three cases that changed her thinking. One involved a young girl who had three abortions, all performed by Altman. I went to the clinic manager and I said, I don't want to do this. Um, she's just using abortion as birth control. And they said, I didn't have the right to make that decision was, uh, wasn't was a judgment that I should be making, and I needed to do the procedure. In 1983, after attending a church service and a private meeting with the pastor, Altman became a Christian. He gave me uh, Josh McDowell's evidence that demands a verdict. It was that point that I finally understood who Jesus was, and at that point, really, I committed my life to him. And, um, and then he just started the long, hard work of transforming me. Part of that transformation included no longer doing abortions. Still, Altman held on to her belief that a woman had the right to terminate an unwanted pregnancy. Two years later, after reading an article comparing abortion with the Nazi Holocaust, she saw herself as a mass murderer. I probably murdered more people than Ted Bundy or any of the mass murderers, if you consider all the abortions that I did. After talking with a Christian counselor, Altman received much needed peace and healing. And during that time, I, in my mind, I could see Jesus's gown and his feet. And I was at his feet crying. And he said to me, are you more powerful than I am? Are you more important than I am? Are you stronger than I am? That I can forgive you, but you cannot forgive yourself. At that point, I understood that he had forgiven me and that I needed to forgive myself. And, and that, that was where I really had my healing. Limbs and organs. Altman is now retired and has dedicated the remainder of her life to fighting for the unborn.
as a board-certified OBGYN and a fellow of the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, she recently urged lawmakers to pass the Heartbeat Protection Act, a measure that would ban abortions at six weeks of pregnancy after an unborn baby's heartbeat is detected. I support the Heartbeat Protection Act because it uses the heartbeat, a very concrete sign of life, that people can identify with to define when the fetus should be protected. She is grateful every day for the opportunity to speak for those she once silenced. I'm so thankful that he's using me to save babies now uh, when once I used to kill them. And, and that's very healing and restorative in itself. Charlene Aaron, CBN News, Jacksonville, Florida. Thanks, Charlene. You know, the Jewish Holocaust in Germany was horrible. It was hideous. It was monstrous. But those Nazis killed about six million people. It was awful what they did. And we never want to have something like that in history again. But I might say in free-loving America, we have terminated the lives of at least 50 million, maybe it's going on now, 60 million unborn babies. So we're at least 10 times as ruthless as the Nazis. And you say, well, the Nazis, it was all uh, compulsory and this is voluntary. Yeah, sure. But those unborn babies aren't voting to get killed. And they do suffer pain, and it is awful what's being done. And this woman, who is a board-certified gynecologist, is saying, I didn't think anything about it. I just thought it was parts, you know, a fetus doesn't have any existence. Now she knows. And ladies and gentlemen, I, I think what's happening around the country is the incidence of abortion is, is diminishing as people begin to understand these babies can feel pain. They are real. They are alive. They have uh, formed parts. You can see them on an ultrasound. They are living human beings. And it's not right to say, well, it's a mother's right to choose. Nonsense. What about the baby's right? All right, Wendy? I'll never forget when I first became a believer, Pat. Um, the light bulb goes on, and you suddenly know abortion is wrong because before you're like, well, it, yeah, it makes sense. It's a woman's right to choose. As soon as Jesus comes in, just like with that doctor, That's right. you know, yeah. and uh, you're never the same. And oh, what a powerful story. Well, up next, a basketball scholarship takes one young player from the poverty of the Bahamas to the parties of Miami come to this party or come hang out. I felt like that's what a man should do, you know, just have sex, you know, and just started messing with, you know, prostitutes. Kind of women online, felt good in the moment. Watch what happens when his promiscuous lifestyle takes its toll on his game after this. Well, what does it take to make a man? What is the measure of a man? Well, to one college star having sex with more and more women was uh, what big uh, Jean-Louis thought it took to be a man. He had no role model since his dad had deserted his family when Mick was just a baby. But soon his obsession with women became an uncontrollable addiction, and it almost destroyed him. Poorly built homes, poor sewer systems, barely any electricity, no proper running water. You look around you, all you see is what you're experiencing. You feel like it's normal. Growing up on the impoverished island of Abaco in the Bahamas, Mick Jean-Louis had little to look forward to in life. When you're a kid, you don't really know what's out there, so all you really know is your reality. Mick was just a baby when his father abandoned the family. His mother worked long hours in the citrus groves to provide for Mick and his two siblings. You see your mom struggling, you're like, man, where's my father? I started kind of questioning God, why we got to struggle so bad, you know? Why we got to live like this? To help out as the man of the house, 
Mick started working odd jobs at age eight to aid his mom while still going to school. Although his excellent grades earned him a spot in the top classes, Mick felt like he didn't belong. Classes where the kids, their parents were doctors, lawyers, bankers, teachers. Sometimes I felt like that wasn't my place because I was experiencing a different reality when I got home. So it was almost like I was in my own little world. One day while staying at his brother's home, Mick discovered porn. Now, instead of being lonely, I had something to go to. I almost kind of filled that void and it made me feel like, hey, this, this is all you need. That was my first real representative like for what a man should be doing. Then a couple of years later, he went to church with a friend where he learned how Jesus rescues all from hell who turn to him. I asked the Lord to come into my heart and forgive me for my sins. Save me, yeah. I want to go to hell. As Mick grew in his newfound faith, his loneliness and desire for porn faded away. You know, my relationship with God definitely was so refreshing because it helped me to understand that I wasn't by myself and I had someone watching over me and um, taking me through life. Meanwhile, Mick was emerging as a star high school basketball player. As he traveled with his team throughout the Bahamas, he began to see basketball as his ticket out. I'd pray, you know, for God to, to help me get a scholarship. So when it started coming true, I was like, man, my prayers are being answered. By his senior year, Mick landed a full ride scholarship to St. Thomas University in Miami. It was a different world, like, you know, I'm a different country. I'm by myself. I was a man now, like a man, man. Time to explore a little bit. Come to this party or come hang out. So when I do certain things, I'll have certain conversations or I'd be in certain environments that I know I shouldn't be in. He also started having sex, even though he knew it was wrong. I had that strong conviction in my heart. I knew when something wasn't right. That guilt started to get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. And that's when you're losing yourself. Mick sought affirmation as a man through pursuing women. I felt like that's what a man should do, you know, just have sex, you know, and just start to mess with, you know, prostitutes. Kind of women online, felt good in the moment, just being there. But, you know, whenever I left, you know, that guilt and like guilt would come back and that conviction, I was being transformed to this person that I didn't know. That person was a man who had drifted far from God and every aspect of his life suffered for it. I wasn't just a basketball player. Like, I was there because of my spiritual life. Even like with basketball, I just felt like it was a spiritual connection. It was God and I lost that part. So my game started suffering. With his focus missing on the court, Mick lost his scholarship at the end of his freshman year. Devastated, he transferred to Weber International University with hopes of playing ball again. Then one night, while waiting to meet a woman, Mick realized how far he had strayed from God. He did all this for me, brought me all the way here from where I came from, and now look what I'm doing. I got emotional, very, very emotional at that point. And I remember just asking God to help me. I don't know how to say no, how to stop it. Like, I need you. I repented right there. It was one of those moments of him reaffirming that to me, that y'all never leave you and I'll forsake you. With God's help, Mick took control of his desires and dedicated his life to pursuing God. As I grew in God, I just started to see myself in a whole different light. And I started to understand that I'm complete. Mick went on to become a three-time All-American for Weber. Now in his senior year, he will graduate with a bachelor's degree in marketing. Mick no longer seeks manhood through women because he knows his identity is found in God. To me, God is everything. He's this friend, he's this comforter, he's this loving father, forgiving father. Yes, everything, everything for me. You know, some of you may not have had a father. Some of you may not have had a mother or you didn't know them, you grew up without the parents. So you didn't have a role model, and uh, 
you know, women begin to be attracted to other women. They, they, they think they're a man. And uh, uh, men begin to, well, you don't know what they're going to wind up being. Because they don't have a role model. They don't have a man they can identify with. That's what Nick's problem was. He didn't know what his father was. He didn't know how to be a man. Let me tell you, the most powerful man who ever lived was somebody named Jesus. He was more powerful and, and than anybody else. But he never was engaged in sexual promiscuity. He never sinned against God. He never got drunk. Uh, he never was out on the party cir circuit. But he gave himself, and he suffered, and he died so that you and I might live. And he gave himself for people like Mick and others like him who were seeking an identity. But he said, you know, you're complete in me. You are complete in me. You come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. I'll give you peace in your soul. And if you're troubled right now, you don't know what your identity is, identify with Jesus. He was the perfect man, but he was the perfect example of the compassion of a woman. He had both sides of humanity complete in him. And he's your role model. And if you want one, I want you to say, I'm going to identify with Jesus. I'm going to let his life be my example, and he will be my example of what I will do in the rest of my life. He is my role model. And if you want that, you won't have any trouble. If you'd like that, I want you to pray with me right now and say yes. Just pray and believe it. Lord Jesus, I want you to be my role model. I want to make my life like yours. And I ask you to come into my heart and perfect yourself in me. And I thank you, Lord, that you will take my life and make it as your own. I give you myself, and I take you as my Savior. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed with me, <clears throat> I have had a number of people the last couple of days who said, we have said yes to Jesus. And I want to give you this right now. You say, what do I do next? Well, it tells you what to do next. What, what if you sin? What if you go away from the Lord? What if you forget your vows? Well, it's all here. It's, in, it's called a new day. I'll give you this free. So I want you to call right now and say, look, I prayed with Pat. I have given my heart to the Lord. And Jesus, from this moment on, is my Savior. And he's my King. And he's my Lord. And he's my role model. The number is on your screen. It's easy to remember. It's 707,000. If you want to go long distance, it's 1-800. It's a toll-free number. 1-800-707,000. So please call right now and say, I have adopted Jesus. He, from this moment on, is my role model. Wendy? Thanks, Pat. Well, still ahead, he married Kim Kardashian and Kanye West, and he's known as the pastor to the stars. I believe everybody in the world is hungry to get a glimpse of who Jesus is. Rich Wilkerson Jr. talks about why he's a friend of sinners on today's 700 Club. Welcome back to the 700 Club. A federal judge has blocked Mississippi's new abortion ban, the toughest in the country, just one day after the governor signed it. The judge issued a temporary restraining order Tuesday. It essentially stops the law from taking effect for 10 days. The court will consider taking further action. The new law bans abortions after 15 weeks. 
Boko Haram militants have set free dozens of Nigerian schoolgirls after abducting them from their village a month ago. A witness said the fighters told residents they had returned the girls out of pity, but warned them, don't ever put your daughters in school again. Boko Haram translates as Western education is forbidden in the local Hausa language. Villagers say about 72 of the 110 girls have been returned. In 2014, the group abducted 276 schoolgirls from Chibok, and about 100 of them have never returned to their families. You can always get the latest from CBN News by visiting our website at CBNNews.com. We'll be back with more of today's 700 Club right after this. Pastor Rich Wilkerson Jr. is unapologetically a friend of sinners, and over the years, he's taken some flack for it. Take a look. Rich Wilkerson Jr. is the pastor of Voo Church in Miami, Florida. He's also the pastor to celebrities and professional athletes, which means Rich gets a lot of questions about who he spends time with and why. I believe everybody in the world is hungry to get a glimpse of who Jesus is. But many times it's church people who are unwilling to get out of the way and therefore they can't see him. In his book, Friend of Sinners, Rich shines a spotlight on a powerful message of faith, hope, and grace that will impact your life forever. And please welcome back to the 700 Club, Rich Wilkerson. Rich, great to see you. Good to see you. Thanks for having me, Wendy. Congrats Appreciate on it. the new book. On oh, new I'm baby. so excited about it. It's been a busy season in our life, but a fun one for so sure. So much to talk about. Well, you've received a lot of questions and some flack about your celebrity friends, uh, the Beeb, Justin Bieber, uh, <laughs> Kanye West, Selena. Uh, we can name drop all day, but you know, but you've turned this. Rather, how did you turn all those questions you get about celebrity friends into a book, Friend of Sinners? Well, you know, this is my, my second book. I wrote a book two years ago called Sandcastle Kings. And actually, you guys let me come on here and chat about it. And while I was doing some of that stuff press around it, people kept asking me some of these questions. How can you be friends with this person or that person? And it was somewhat perplexing to me because I'm going... Have you studied the life of Jesus? <laughs> Jesus is the friend of sinners. And that's what they called him. That was his nickname. And the reason why was because he was on a mission to save people, to love people. That's right. And so as you read the New Testament, what you find out about Jesus is he's always in these places that maybe society says that he does not belong. Mm. Yet he was doing so with a purpose and a plan. And I think really this book is a book, the subtitle is Why Jesus Cares More About Relationship Than Perfection. Right. So the heart of this book is that you would discover God's love for you, mm. that God is for you. You'd be reminded of the gospel. But as you encounter that gospel and that grace for yourselves, yeah. I think as you exhale, you exhale this faith to reach people yourself. And, that's, and you become a friend of sinners. God sees you. That's the first chapter I went to because that's on. the one I wanted to know about the most. Why do you think, Rich, that so many Christians are reluctant to have friends outside the church? Well, I think many times what we're afraid of is we're afraid of areas that we can't control. And I think sometimes we get nervous going, am I going to be influenced or are they going to influence right. me? And I think there's no doubt about it. You study the life of Jesus. He had 12 guys that had the same convictions that were on the same path as he was that he was doing life with. Out of that 12, he had three friends that yeah. were really his foundational guys that he stuck with. I think the same thing for every believer, that we need to be yoked up with people that are going in the same direction. But I think we have to have this same mentality as Jesus to go, man, I came to love people. And if we're going to ever, ever change the world, we won't do so not being a part of it. Yeah. And so whatever we avoid, I think darkness tends to invade. That's what I love so much about CBN is your guys' <laughs> intentionality to go where people are, go to people's homes yeah. with the good news. Be in the world, but not of the world. Absolutely. And of course, Jesus was without sin. He was perfect. But say somebody, they've come out of addiction. They've come out of pornography, something, and, and, and they've come out of a lifestyle of yeah. sin. And so now they're a believer and maybe they're, they're, they're afraid to, to be friends with the unchurched because they don't want to fall back into absolutely. that. Absolutely. So that's wisdom. There's some wisdom there's there, right? Ab there's absolutely yeah. wisdom. And I think, once again, I think the foundational message of this book is discovering God's love and his, his outworking, his reach towards us. I think you absolutely have to have wisdom, parameters, boundaries. You have to know who you are, where you're at. And I think you've got to have the right people in your life as a foundational force. People are either going to push you forward or pull you back. I want to get people in my life that are pushing me forward. Rich, why do you think it was so important for Jesus to hang out with the sinners, to be their friend? And, and you know, and he was 
uh, persecuted for it. You know, he was called a, a wine bibber or drunkard, yeah, yeah. you know, and you're hanging out with the prostitutes. I mean, but, but he, he, he didn't care. Well, I think what's important to discover is that as Jesus was criticized, his famous saying back to the Pharisees at that time, as they called him the friend of sinners, he said, I didn't come for the healthy. Mm. I came for the sick. Amen. And I even think when they heard that, they might have gone, oh, we like, we like that phrase. That, that'll tweet, that'll Instagram. <laughs> and the point was that they had missed out what he was saying. He was saying, I've come for everybody, but it's only those that recognize that they're in need of me. Meaning all of us are the sinners. Sinner doesn't mean that I'm a bad person. Sin by definition in the Bible means that I'm dead. And so Jesus didn't come to make bad people good. He came to make dead people alive. Yeah. And he's come to be all of our friends. We just have to recognize that we're in need of his friendship. Well, in addition to your new book, you have a new baby. Yes. And there is a story behind this baby. You and your wife, Don Cherie, went through what, 10 years of infertility? We went through, we've been married for 11 years. And then about eight years ago, we started trying sure. to have children. That's when we discovered that we were gonna have a bit of a journey in front of us. And so after eight years of trying, believing, <laughs> praying, uh, we just had our miracle son just uh, eight weeks ago. And really. we've got his name, his name is Wyatt. Wesley Wilkerson. So if you notice, his initials are WWW. Right. So the big joke is World Wide Web. I don't think people even use WWW anymore, but he, he's triple dub in our house. So it's Wyatt Wesley. I mean, that's a long, how did that journey of infertility, I mean, what did you, what did you guys learn through I that? I think we learned so much, you know, and always looking back, it's always easier to connect the dots and it's always easier to be thankful. I learned that a waiting season doesn't have to be a wasted season mm. and that we can learn to discover who Jesus is. I think I learned more about God in those last eight years than I have any other time. And the yeah. big thing for my wife and I is that we came to this place where we said, whether we have a child or not, we're complete in Jesus. We have all right. that we have in him. And so um, about three or four years ago, my wife who teaches publicly, she shared her story for the first time of not being able to have children. And so she sort of testified, if you will, from the valley. And what was cool about that is that four years later after she has the miracle, it's been so much fun because people all around us, wow. around the world have celebrated with us. And I think it's just a good story about when you go with, through the trials with people in the valley, it makes the miracles in the mountaintops that much better. And wow. so we've just felt the love from all over the world and we're, we're grateful. A new book, a new baby, a thriving church down in Miami called The Vu. Vu Church. Which I just found out is short for Rendezvous. Rendezvous. I Meeting love it. Place. I love it. So a lot going on. And I like that just, pink book in your hand, by the way. Um, this, I do awesome too. It goes great with my dress. Okay. <laughs> Rich's latest book is called Friend of Sinners and it's available wherever books are sold. Plus, you can hear more from Rich in a social exclusive interview on our Facebook page. Just go to facebook.com slash 700 Club. Rich, it's always a pleasure. So God grateful. Thanks for having me. We love you guys. Amen. We love you guys too. Well, still to come, we've got your email. Vicki says, if you told a lie in your past and have asked for forgiveness, do you need to ask forgiveness and come clean with everyone involved? Or is the Lord the only one that you need to ask? Your questions and some honest answers coming up next. Mary Frazier and her husband lost everything when Hurricane Harvey hit their hometown. They merely escaped with their lives when their pickup stalled in flood waters in the aftermath of storm. Well, Mary didn't know where to turn to help until she met the volunteers from Operation Blessing. Hurricane Harvey dumped record amounts of rain on South Texas causing widespread flooding and forcing an estimated 100,000 families out of their homes. Mary Frazier was among them. She and her husband had to be rescued from their pickup truck when it stalled in high water. All I could see was death. I just knew I was gone, and it wasn't a pretty sight. When the waters receded, the couple was allowed to return to what was left of their home. We had lost everything. We lost our home, everything in the home. We lost of automobiles. Then Operation Blessing showed up in Mary's neighborhood and began helping with the overwhelming task of cleaning out flood damaged houses. We didn't know then what we were gonna do. So Operation Blessings came and that's exactly what they are, blessing. Operation Blessing volunteers removed carpets, furniture, sheetrock, and other water soaked materials. It not only reduced the risk of mold and other health hazards, it was the first step to helping residents get back on their feet. For people like Mary, 
Operation Blessing brought more than just helping hands. Operation Blessings gave me so much hope, not just hope, they physically gave me hugs and compassion and just everything that I could possibly, I needed, I needed all of that. They are just a blessing in every capacity, emotional, physically, spiritually. As the people of Texas continue rebuilding their lives, Operation Blessing will be there offering help and support. Glory to God, I praise God for I just, just can't say enough how much I am appreciative of these people. Operation Blessing has just been so, so much of a blessing to us because we just couldn't have done it without them. Well, we're here for you, and Operation Blessing is one of the uh, outreaches that is so important in the lives of so many people. Mm. So anyhow, that's wonderful. When you see those reactions and those yeah, tears, great, you just want to jump through the TV and give them a hug and Amen. get out there and help them and more. All right. well, well, um, what's next? You well, got we have a... Uh, we have a DVD that we're giving people right. when they join. Tell, tell them about it. You put it, you did it. You and Scott I did Ross. It. <laughs> it was That's a, right. It's an amazing DVD. It's called Answer Prayer. Um, these are how to pray effectively and see God at work in your life. These stories will amaze you and encourage your faith. Um, this uh, guy, Dave from Girton, North Carolina, he's seen it. He said Answer Prayer was very helpful. Forgiveness, that spoke volumes to me as I identified five, five former friends that I have harbored hatred toward and now realize that I had formed a wall in my prayer life. Thank you, Pat. Wow, Amen. you transformed his life. Okay, we'll, we'll this All is right, yours when you call. All right, we've got this question from Vicki. She says, my question is, if you told a lie in your past and have asked for forgiveness, do you need to ask forgiveness and come clean with everyone involved? Or is the Lord the only one that you need to ask? Well, it depends on what it is. It, did your lie hurt somebody? Is it a, an ongoing thing where people will be confused? Did you lie about your status, for example, and you're still riding on that status? Did, did you say you were married and you weren't, or you say you were this, that, and the other, and, and you, that deceit goes on? Well, of course, you've got to clarify it. I think that's what you're asking me. You told one lie, it doesn't affect anybody, that's different. But, you know, the Bible says when you stand praying, if you remember that somebody has ought against you, go to that person. Leave your, your gift at the altar. Go to that person, make it right, and then go back and offer your gift. So, hey, if you've hurt somebody and they, they hate you, they want to kill you, well, I think you better go talk to them. That's the idea. All right. All right. Ann says, my husband and I differ greatly on whether Jesus is also God. I've always believed that he is, but my husband no longer believes this because of some new teachings he's been listening to. His change in beliefs is causing me to question some of these things myself. How can Jesus call God his Father, yet be God himself? Can you give me some solid scriptural evidence regarding this? Well, if, if you look at uh, the Gospel of John, you find that there's a man named Thomas. He was known as Doubting Thomas. And uh, in the resurrection, Jesus appeared to him and uh, he said, okay, unless I stick my finger in the thumbprints and into your side, I won't believe. And Jesus said, okay, do it. And he did. And then he said, my Lord and my God. Well, for a Jew to say that, that was a big deal, because that would have been blasphemy unless it was for real. Uh, Jesus said, you know, I am the Messiah. He, he, you know, they, they stood before uh, the uh, Sanhedrin when he was... Uh, uh, under trial, and they said, uh, you know, what about you? He said, you will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven <clears throat> and, uh, uh, with the, and sitting at the right hand of the power. And they said, well, that's the kind of blasphemy. But Jesus himself was saying it. So, but you ask about the Trinity. Well, there's the Father, there's the Son, and there's the Holy Spirit. And it's a mystery, and I haven't got time, unfortunately, in answering this question to go into all the questions of the Trinity. But that's the idea, is that the, the Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son, and it's the relationship of Father and Son that brings forth the Holy Spirit. So that, that's, is He God? Yes, He is very man, and yes, very God. 
Amen. Okay. Right. God, here's one from Natalia. She says, I had to leave the man I love because he started emotionally abusing me and neglecting me. He wasn't the same man I fell in love with. During our time apart, I hope that he will change with God's help, and I hope we will soon be back together. Can God really change a heart? Of course he can. He does it all the time. Uh, people are dramatically changed. That's what born again means. <laughs> I mean, you're, you're a new person. So can he change him? Yes. And I think what you're doing is, is okay right now because you cannot be, expose yourself to that kind of environment. All right? Amen. All right. Amber says, I feel I'm living a nightmare. What do you do when someone feels they have control of you? I feel so trapped. Please tell me what to do. I, I don't think you've told me enough that I can tell you what to do. Would you feel trapped? Or you're in a situation of an abuse. Uh, you're a, a free, independent person, and I think you need to come free of it. Sounds like she's in fear. Uh, in fear. I mean, I don't know whether they, you know, there's uh, shelters for abused women. Uh, there's uh, there are legal matters that you can take up. I don't know what's wrong, but the answer is you have control of your life. Take control and get out of that situation. And there are p plenty of people who want to help you if you just seek either a church or a judge or a lawyer or something to get you out of that situation. Well, we leave you with today's Power Minute from First Peter. Above all things, have fervent love for one another, for love will cover a multitude of sin. Well, for Wendy and all of us, this is Pat Robertson. Thank you so much for being with us, and we'll look forward to talking to you tomorrow. See you then. Bye-bye.